ageism, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Whoa. Right, exactly. He's eight. Nope. <laughs> right. Okay, well, you ready to go? Of course, ma'am. Okay. Let's go ahead and call the order and if we can get a roll call. Carl. Yeah. Chair Dowdwell, here. Councilmember Diller. Uh, here. Councilmember Edens. Here. Councilmember Jordan. Here. Councilmember Stevens. Here. Councilmember Werther. Present. Councilmember Bertolino. Councilmember Brost. Okay, mm. don't if we can have do we have any adjustments to the minutes from the last meeting that we need to make? If we could have a motion and a second for approval. Motion. Second. Moved. And we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Uh, abstain. Okay. We have public in the audience, um, but we also have some individuals are, who are here to speak as well. So I'm just double checking to make sure that nobody has any public comments that they would like to make to the um, committee here before we get started. With our Doesn't look like it. Okay. We'll go ahead and get um, started with our guest speakers here from Studio Montage. Uh, to kind of review what it is they're trying to do here in the live board with all of us and we can see how we can assist them, how they can assist the city. We'll all right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Tina is also going to talk a little bit. Okay. Um, and if you would just grab one as we go along, it's not. It's not a uh, homework or anything. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay, so um, I'm Bert Vandermark, and um, I am, in a nutshell, born in Holland and came to the United States uh, when I was 23 to study art and finish my degree studying. But I started at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in, in Holland. So I'm a classically trained artist. And, Everything I've been done and doing in the United States in art is um, through uh, the kind hospitality of this country, and I'm so very, very pleased by that. And I was able to get an MFA degree in art, and then started teaching um, art at various universities in Missouri. And the first one was Southwest Missouri State University in Springfield. I was faculty there for eight, eight years, and then. Came to St. Louis and taught at Washington University in the art department for six years and then Webster University for another four years. And so I have a very strong academic teaching background in art. Um, and in addition to that, I started my own design studio and it's been in operation for the past 26 years. And we do work primarily for. Uh, I'm so nervous. I feel like I'm on, <laughs> on, on the impeachment committee or something. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, I was just going to say, you can sit if you feel more comfortable. Oh gosh. <laughs> so, um, so professionally, I've been primarily creative director and art director for a studio, doing uh, educational publishing with. Publishers like Houghton Mifflin, McGraw Hill, Pearson, and so a lot of the school books that um, kids see in the classrooms are probably something that we've worked on over the years. And um, so I had a building in Shrewsbury, and I had uh, at any given moment about 12 artists working for me, doing digital design and working on projects. And um, and then, you know, the workforce kind of changed into a digital environment and where people are not really required to be in the same building off and on every, every week. And so I've become now a virtual company. And since we moved back to Wildwood um, about a year ago, um, I was looking for some um, office space to, um, to work in and, um, and Miller House was um, kind of jumped out at me as a good environment. And so, um, so I moved in uh, in August in, with a purpose, and, and that purpose seems to be unfolding itself on a daily basis. 
One of the things that I quickly realized was that the Miller House is a very unique environment for Wildwood, and, um, and there's a lot of things that I could contribute to it to make it an even more welcoming place. And one of the things that um, I dabble with in my spare time is art as a ministry. And as you can tell from the handouts, I do this with art parties or art uh, invites to have, to bring families together, to uh, have fun together, exploring art as an expression. And then art shows, I've done art shows um, of uh, work that was produced by participants in churches, in local churches, and, um, using art as an encouragement to work with um, youth struggling with how to spend their time away from the electronic media and uh, being less preoccupied with their phone and uh, getting them into an opportunity to have dialogue with each other. And so, Everything about me has to do with bringing families together and creating events that, um, you know, that, that, that transform or help transform lives. And so, um, so as I started talking with Andy about that, I mean, that's exactly what the Miller House is about. And, um, and I thought, you know, and it's weird, it, Miller House is a weird place because it's not really about coffee, even though that's probably the reason why a lot of people go. It's not even really about wine or, or drinking. It's not considered, in my mind, to be a bar, but then if you wanted to have a glass of wine, you could do that. Um, you could also just bring your laptop and just sit and work and use it as a space. And, and so we've been gathering people as I've been there for a shorter time as I've been that seem to have been brought there for a purpose, and Tina is a person who's an example of that. Um, but for the, as I was, you know, driving my short commute home every two minutes, I get to think about a few things, and one of the things I was thinking about is, how could we, how could we bring, or could we bring a cultural center to Wildwood, and could that be housed at the Miller House, or how could we create cultural events that would be um, a way of bonding the community together for a good cause. And, and so I, I've met Joe uh, Garantino um, on a number of um, outside events that, <laughs> that I worked on with him. He's a go-getter. Mm -hmm. And then Julian was another person that I met um, who kindly invited me to project this onto you. And so, um, the visual materials that I'm sharing with you is just some of the things that I've done in other in encounters. I'm not, I'm not really interested in starting a business doing this. I'm not really doing this for the money that needs to be generated. But I'm finding that the Miller House is there, and it's a space, and it's, it has good vibes, and it has potential. And so I guess what I'm asking you to do is to think outside of the box <laughs> a little bit and see, and at least make you aware that I'm there, and, and see if we could have uh, some agreement about some events that we could maybe bring into the Miller House that would help cater the community. And so, well, Tina, why don't you come over and introduce yourself? Okay. She, again, was one of those Magical Encounters. <laughs> so, yeah, my name is Tina Sayers, and I work with the Box Society of St. Louis. Um, I'm sorry, I'm the what society? The Box society. society. So I am their Director of Education and Community Engagement, and I also teach voice at Missouri Baptist University. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a lot of connections with the arts communities in St. Louis. And one of the things that the Box Society specifically, but I know other arts organizations as well, have been looking at a lot recently, is how can we bring in more audiences, new audiences, extend our reach. And so when I was sitting at Miller House working on my laptop, <laughs> Bert and I struck up a conversation and, and he found out what I was doing and, um, and he said, you know, I wonder if, if you would ever be interested in bringing some people out here to do a concert, either at the Miller House or somewhere else in town. And I wanted to just piggyback on what he's saying to say we would always be um, open to doing that. 
Uh, so we have a lot of, we could bring either a smaller choir, we're a choir of about 80 to 100 singers, but we can, and they're, it's a professional choir. We do have volunteers, but we also have paid singers. Um, we have four young artists who are paid a stipend to, uh, to be sort of section leaders, but also we are training them up to be performers uh, in their own right. Most of them are either graduate students or recently have graduated from college with degrees in vocal performance. So we have a, a soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. They often do community concerts and other engagements that are on a smaller scale as well, and they love to perform, so that would be a really easy fit to bring a smaller ensemble like that. We even do house concerts sometimes with them, so there are tons of options that we can um, discuss if we wanted to bring the Box Society here. But another idea that I think would be really exciting in a lot of respects is what Bert and I were kind of imagining would be, um, <laughs> I jokingly call it the Wildwood Culture Club, that we could start a little organization where we encourage people to buy tickets to an event in the city, whether it's to a Box Society concert or to an art museum you know, showing or, or gallery that's happening. Um, or any other, a trip to the Fox, but that we would sell the ticket where, potentially, people could come to a place like the Miller House, gather there, have a drink or have a cup of coffee, get to kind of meet each other, and then get shuttled into the city to whatever the event is and back. And the shuttle thing, that you know, maybe there's a church that would be willing to donate a shuttle, maybe there's um, a shuttle service that for instance, the Box Society might be able to help fund, or for the sale of a ticket, that includes the cost of the shuttle. There's all sorts of ways we could work that out. But I think it, there's a lot of potential for, again, reaching audiences that either don't like to drive into the city by themselves, or late at night, or they're older and they just don't do that much anymore. Mm -hmm. But if we can shuttle them in, that's, that opens up a whole new um, you know, group of people that can patronize these events more easily yeah. and, and also build a sense of community here. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, bringing the city into Wildwood or bringing culture, cultural access that we have, bringing it into Wildwood and making it available yeah. and accessible also to new residents. You know, I, I, I've talked to a bunch of new couples who um, discovered the Wild, the Miller House and, and they said, you know, we don't really know our way around, we don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So what a great way, you know, if you, if you give them a cultural pass, you know, mm -hmm. or even as a gift item. I, I'm from Holland originally, so uh, whenever you go to Amsterdam, you can buy a culture pass, or, mm -hmm. and it gets you access to a number of museums, and, you know, and so I have relationships with the St. Louis Symphony, mm -hmm. and now the Box Society, and, you know, the Art Museum, and... Um, and I'm also part of the Desley well, Box Society is part of the Desley Collaborative Arts Group mm -hmm. that um, is hosted by UMSL's music education program. So people from the symphony, people from the Box, people from you know Metro Theater, all sorts of organizations are part of that collective. So anyone that you know that we start, if we started to do this with you guys through the Box Society, we could easily open this up to other people mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think so it would at, be at really this point, you know, we're kind of looking for a a task team or a task force and you know have people if you have recommendations of people that you say wow this is a great idea mm -hmm. well, I'd love for you to know this person or that person I'm grateful that Joe's here because he's he's well aware of this initiative as well we've had some Saturday morning meetings about what we can do to Wildwood in bringing culture and bringing it alive and well and so I'm just um, again, we were talking with Andy as we left, and you know, we kept thinking, you know, is this coincidental or is this meant to be? And you know, it seems to be like um, the last few months have been well, filled. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there's some other people that uh, that are walked in. <coughs> uh, I know there's already an art being on display at the Miller House. That I'm going to try to elevate the quality of that, but um, but Rob. Ruben uh, Carrillo Korea. has been sort of coordinating that. So, not to say that I don't like his taste, but I mean, I think we could up it up a little bit. Um, the um, the goal would be to kind of make the Miller House the place to go if you want to know 
you know, we could have St. Louis Symphony evenings, we could have book clubs, we could have, um, and that right now there's a starting of a group of homeschoolers that are coming in now, there's people, um, seniors that are coming in, mm -hmm. um, um, card games and things like that, and so, um, especially with uh, some of the nursing homes in Wildwood, mm -hmm. it would be very good to have some things coordinated with them, and, uh, if you could help us out, pointing us in the direction of shuttle services, that would be okay. You know, basically, again, this is not about making money, but it's about building community and mm -hmm. uh, and still get things paid for, obviously. But we're not going to double all the prices to make a huge profit or anything. Um, there's another walk-in that is um, is going to be a regular attender at the Miller House, and that's ARC Angels Foundation. And they specifically deal with um, Kennedy Brown, she's the president of the organization. And they deal specifically with suicides, preventing suicides on the high school and community college level. Mm -hmm. And they go into schools and do counseling and, and, um, and talk to parents and things like that. So, um, and I do quite a bit of stress relief through an art, not therapeutic art, but art is also have effectively been using art and, uh, in the rehabilitation of people who are dealing with uh, poor self-image. and I, I have about eight years of experience doing that. So mm -hmm. if we want to lean it into sort of a crisis or a help center, have some of that come in with counseling, especially in this society, and it's not a bad thing to have. And um, that's why. Kind of coincidental because the Box Society is working as part of our festival season in May. We're going to be doing a concert on um, the power of music in terms of healing and yeah. what it, how it affects your mind and your psyche and all of that. So yeah. we're exploring that with some faculty at Maryville in their music therapy department. They're going to do a presentation on that as well. And mm -hmm. we we're doing a concert about that. So it's yeah. funny how that all kind of ties yeah, together. I'd, like, I'd love to have a closer relationship with the Wildwood Police Department. and. Uh, incorporate the fire department as well and, and you know any trauma relief for their families in certain community so it's you know veterans very important aspect of this as well so anyway <laughs> that's about all we want to say maybe right now any so questions when i met with her back in november and he presented this concept at that time for some kind of a cultural community space in wildwood bringing in programming workshops and so on um, being a business owner in Wildwood and a resident of Wildwood, I thought it would be appropriate for him to come speak to the committee about his ideas, um, what this committee thinks of those, and then if there's any involvement the city will be participating in as far as its workshops, whether it's promoting, partnering, or anything that we think would be appropriate. Yeah, we're, we're you know, like I said, I wasn't looking for this job. <laughs> <laughs> this is just in addition to all my other stuff. But um, I do think that there's um, something that we can put together that would actually almost, I would think at this point, we'd come together very much in just growing together as we spread the news. And so I, mm -hmm. I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Julian is a good supporter of us. <laughs> so. Questions? Okay. Ideas? I'm pointing at the right person. I'm saying the I know what you meant. It's okay. Objections. <laughs> no, I, I had a, a couple questions. Um, I noticed that you mentioned in here a ministry angle as well, at least in the past. Is that still part of what you do? And how yeah, does that, yeah. How does I, that fit into? I know you said some self help. Well, it's, it's very much of who I am. I mean, I'm, I'm a committed Christian for the past 30 years, and uh, I do a lot of Bible study groups and I'm one of the leaders at Grace Church and McKelvey Road, Grace Church St. Louis. And so um, one of the things I am offering on Friday afternoon is a Bible study open to anyone, the general public. And interestingly enough, I've, um, I've had four pastors stop by my office lately to introduce themselves and so we're going to be I'm going to be working with Living Word Church mm -hmm. and then also very well connected with New Community Church in Wildwood and I'm, I'm trying to get connected with the Wildwood Christian Church and uh, 
So yeah, uh, prayerfully, Bible study. And, and usually when I do painting classes, I, I teach from the parables. So I don't necessarily, you know, I don't cram Christianity into kids' throat, but I, I do think that there's, um, that as a committed Christian, I'm, I'm not just called to teach people how to paint, I'm also there to teach them values about, you know, truth, and, and that they are biblical, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily um, throwing Jesus out there every five minutes, but but, but that's separate and distinct from the art part, or are the two mingle? So the they Friday can mingle. Is they don't have. I prefer they mingle. But if you say, "Gosh, you know, it sounds awfully uh, Christ Christian easy to me," or you know, what, what do you do for it? It's a um, it's a soft. It's a, it, it's about reaching out into the community, and and I, I will make a personal statement about where my beliefs about community come from, but it's not designed to to bring people into an understanding of who Christ is necessarily. Hopefully through the through what how the community is built, the, a desire to be part of a community such as that would bring further clarification in okay. regards to what we're, what what was behind it all to begin with, which is ultimately love and reaching out and people, loving your neighbor. I think your idea of bringing all the culture pieces together is, is great, um, and the spiritual as well. Um, in terms of a connection that maybe would make sense within the area, and I'm going to kick myself because I can't think of the name of the organization, but um, I had a neighbor in Wildwood who ran, and I don't know if you would know, um, he ran a Marines. Marines assistant. Oh yeah, yeah. But you knew him. What, what was? No, I do know him. His name is Tom Hilkes. Mm -hmm. Tom. Yeah, he since has kind of moved out of Wildwood at least a little he's bit. In but Eureka. he's in, he's close, and um, it's a nonprofit thing. There's this work yeah. with um, mm -hmm. Marines that have, you know, had disabilities and and things mm -hmm. like that, training to go back out, and they have a pretty big reach. So that might be a nice mm -hmm. mix too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in the bats. If you very leave me your contact information, maybe I can help connect yeah, with that. Yeah, it's in there. It's in, there's an email. Yeah. Is it in here? Yeah, it's by, I was part of the package. And then the last question I had was for you, Tina. Um, with the singing, you mentioned having an idea maybe it could involve a shuttle. Um, and you said there are like 80 to 100 singers. Is there, if there were a venue here, like maybe something outside or something like that, you know, in nice weather, is that something, does it, do the performers have to perform in the city or is performing in Wildwood an option? So performing in Wildwood is an option for a smaller group probably at this time. I would love to see the whole group be able to come. It would have to be indoors because of acoustics. We're an acoustic group. <laughs> um, and we use a lot of in, uh, orchestral instruments that okay. are, they can't subject themselves to weather. Some of the violinists that pay $50,000 for their yeah. violins would not do it like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so the small group can easily transport the larger group if we had a space that could host them at a church or something we could certainly put that on our programming however we just have been going over and researching in more depth our demographic of where our ticket sales are and the overwhelming majority of our ticket sales is east of 240 up 270 yeah. but also even closer into the city you know thinking mm -hmm. clayton ladue to the the riverfront basically so it doesn't really make sense for us to come here financially because we don't there's no guarantee that people would come this far yeah. west mm -hmm. for our concerts for our normal ticket goers and without enough sort of exposure out here with people that are interested in this kind of music if there are people that are interested in this kind of music um, then it's hard to draw an audience that would fill the seats out here so I would love to say yes it would be a harder sell administratively, but maybe by doing these things and building up an audience, that would open more doors to that in the future, mm -hmm. which would be fantastic. We would love to expand our audience base a lot. So yeah, I mean, uh, there's the box passion mm -hmm. that you're mm -hmm. doing in March. The St. John passion we're doing in March. Again, that mm -hmm. that would be. Why would that not be made available? Uh, right. You know, right. as an opportunity for everybody should go, go through that one. 
And I'm, I'm more than happy, I'll give you guys all my cards, and I'm more than happy to shoot, like, you know, emails or brochures or whatever if you just know people personally that want to come out. And, and these, you know, are, these are performances at churches. Mm -hmm. no, most of them are churches. We do our Christmas performance at Fall Hall. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. but I mean, churches I, just have the right space and the right acoustics yeah. and all of that. My know. dream would be that, you know, we would have some churches in, in Wa would be interested in hosting mm -hmm. this and, mm -hmm. and get the taste for that going yes, so yeah. that they would be coming. I think we probably would eventually. Oh, I think Don't so you think too. people yeah. would come? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think so if mm -hmm. we had something. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren because she had a question and then we'll get to Tim. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so a couple of things. Um, I think one thing in terms of how to promote your business is where we run into some trickiness. And, mm -hmm. and I say this as a practicing Christian, I do Bible study, I sing in a choir, I go to church, is when we start using public resources, um, when there has to be a definition of separation between church and state. So right. I would feel comfortable about talking about how you're at Miller House, but I would not feel comfortable with a Facebook post promoting a painting and religious event. But I would encourage you, because that's what you're called to do, to keep that together, because that's kind of the niche that you've found that you have joy in. And right, you, right, right. So I don't think you would necessarily want to separate it just for us. But there are other things that we could work with you on if you would kind of put that on the back burner just temporarily mm -hmm. and, and not lose that as part of your mission as a right. whole. But um, the, there, that's kind of a different situation that we're in because of that. Um, it's funny that you brought up the cultural arts Center. I was talking to a resident on the phone today about this, and then I also um, talked with um, uh, um, about what it would look like, you know, to have a community band. Or uh, Council Member Greg Mountie and I were talking about what it would look like to have a meetup, pick up strings group, and things like that. Yeah. And so what I'm picturing is a. Have you been to Columbia, Missouri? Uh. Or Mizzou is. Only for volleyball okay. games. Yes. <laughs> so they, they started, um, when I was in grad school and at the end of my undergrad, developing a community and cultural arts district. So they did a revitalization of an area and they put in smaller art galleries, they put in collectives, and then um, they, they put in some additional venues. Not totally what we're talking about because the university in many ways already had that. They already had a place for the symphony to play, they had other halls. And so what this did was it not only provided a showcase in a retail space, but meeting spaces for small groups and a place for artists and residents. So you're in residence, but what that would look like if it was tailored to musicians and artists. The other thing is while Miller House can accommodate some of this, you know, what if you'd like to have a play as a community? Well, where do you do that? There's actually really not a great space for that. Lafayette's busy most of the time. Some of the churches are busy. You know, a lot of times you have to convert space and then take it back, especially if you're in a more contemporary setting. Um, and there's not places really to rehearse because you just don't have the room in City Hall for that. So if we ever look at building something in the future, we would want to not only have a place for people to come look at that would showcase the gallery, artists and residence rooms. We would want to have the music rooms or places that could be used as a general community space and then an actual performance venue. Something that's not only curved for the bell shape for the music and has, I would either think, tiered or at least a raised platform, but also can be converted to stage. So you're looking at access wings, you know, if there was proper lighting, and this is, this is a lot of money, so you really need a nonprofit. You need community grants or you need co-op. So those are, the, those are the revenues for that. And then there's ways for cities to partner because that is a public mm -hmm. and not solely religious, right. religious thing. Mm -hmm. So um, and I think the other thing that you're describing is the strong socialization aspect. So there's an online thing, it's called Meetup Groups. I've never done it, but I've heard about it. You're almost describing that in Wildwood, so a permanent functioning meetup group. So um, we have looked at what it would be like to purchase ball tickets. We tried that this year with the Cardinals games. We've talked about what it would be like if we did the Botanic Gardens mm -hmm. night for Wildwood. So I think that there's potential for that. I know there's issues with like if we assume liability for shuttles and there would be an accident, mm -hmm. even if we contracted them. So that would be something we'd have to think about. And, and like you said, if that's built into the cost of the tickets, and then a couple of other things, I mean, 
but besides the, the music leading groups, I know you mentioned um, book reading, book clubs. Um, it's got a different name, but we'll call it the Stitch and Witch group. A lot of campuses and small communities have that for knitting and things. If you're, yeah, okay. okay. It's, got, it's got another word, but it's, yeah. it's commonly used. Well, I wonder why you're looking at it. You just gotta look at the topic and look at it like that. Okay, do you give it a new name? I'm just turning around. Yeah, I mean, um, this, this, is, this, is, so, this yeah. is good because, yeah. you know, I mean, part of what we're blurting out is something that maybe a lot of you have already thought about, and I think more than anything, we're just trying to make ourselves available, yes. and we're yeah. interested in exploring. Yes, ultimately, it would have to be a foundation, and, mm -hmm. but I... But I I think I'm excited to share with you that we'd love to see the Miller House be the incubator, mm -hmm. and maybe the reason right. for, you know, and and maybe have some meetings there. And, and there may end up being ideas. more than one location right. you know, that may start and there and grow figure out. out you know, maybe things. we are, maybe we are virtual in some yeah. places, and maybe we have the collaboration of some public spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can, can you tell me when the Box Society does performances, what is your average crowd size and what do you sell out at? About, well, it depends on the venue. Okay. But about 300 is, three, 350 is about our typical audience size, okay. so we can fill a big church. Mm -hmm. um, just, if anyone knows, um, what's the church in Kirkwood? Kirkwood Press. Okay. Yeah. Right there on Adams mm -hmm. Avenue. Mm -hmm. That's one of the spaces we use frequently, okay. and it's usually packed. So the reason, the reason why I ask is I think some of it's also um, communication and network building. So yes. when you're talking about what your audience is, and your audience is typically those that would go to the St. Louis Symphony, and that's not in West mm -hmm. County. So mm -hmm. my church hosted the full St. Louis Symphony again. $20 free parking, and again, it's the second time. So there are organizations in West County already Good. doing some of this. Good. Yeah. And it's about how do we connect you to that yeah. Yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Which, and can I just add one more thing yes. about, so just this is an offering to all of you for now and future, but um, I am a Wildwood resident, okay. live just right down the street, mm -hmm. um, but I moved here three years ago from San Diego, and when I was there, I, we lived in a part of San Diego that was not as well connected artistically. Mm -hmm. It was very close to the border, and so there were a lot of you know mixed demographics and mixed socioeconomics and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and the schools there were running out of money quickly for any kind of arts education or physical education and stuff. So I started a community center for the arts there mm -hmm. um, in South San Diego that is still up and running today, I'm happy to say. Um, but so I have some experience dealing, at least on a small mm -hmm. scale, because it was a very, right. What was your primary funding source? Um, we offered classes, so tuition, and okay. we were able to un operate under the nonprofit of our church. Okay. So we didn't have overhead expenses, you which is. have a community college adjacent that you had to compete with? Because that no. would be part of the problem. Is not the right there, not, not immediately okay. next to. Okay. Um, and I don't know that this would be that kind of a thing. I don't know that this would be, you know, um, a place, because we did like music lessons and dance lessons. And yeah, we've got the ability here. Right, but you have that with have that. that. Mm -hmm. with, in our public schools and right, our right. private schools yeah. quite extensively. I'm going to switch over to Tim. Okay. That's, okay. That's okay. We do. We are in a little bit limited time frame tonight. Yeah. I appreciate you, you both coming out and talking. I think the Miller House, I'll tell you, I think it's a perfect opportunity to kind of, as I would say, dip the toe in, put your foot in the water or whatever, just kind of get that, that started. Um, admittedly, our Mr. Vujic, I know, is behind me here, um, and he'll, he'll probably listen to this, probably make a note of it, and then might want to get back to you. Uh, our art festival in the fall. It's great. It would also seem to be an ideal opportunity for a small yeah. group of the Box Society to perform at. Mm. I know there's and music for the music there yes. from time to time. A booth for so, art lessons during that process. Yes, well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's mm -hmm. one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is the art side of it, yeah. which I think can provide you, Bert, an opportunity as well. Uh, so that there are perfect opportunities, there are a number of opportunities there uh, to see things by using the Miller House as a, as a starting point, mm -hmm. getting the name out. So that mm -hmm. when the fall comes around, if, if Box Society gets hired per se, 
uh, to perform, it's a perfect opportunity. Or mm -hmm. if you end up with a booth at the at the art uh, mm -hmm. festival, it's a perfect opportunity for you to get outside yeah. those walls. All those things tend to stand out as op immediate opportunities mm -hmm. and thoughts to at least grow things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I, I wanted to meet with you because well, more or less, I'm I'm not quite <coughs> sure like how to advertise it, whatever this is yet. Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. And we, I don't want to come out of the box mm -hmm. right. in the wrong with the wrong tone, so. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and we also and, don't want to step on the toes of other things and we that don't want it to, going on. We don't really <laughs> want it to be about the box society, yeah. and, and I don't want it really to be about me, but at the same time, right. I'm, I'm such a, I, could, I really would love to be involved in the art festival, the point, and maybe yeah. look at some of the art that's mm -hmm. going, mm -hmm. and, and on behalf of Wildwood, and sort of mm -hmm. be used as a filter, because I mean, 18 years of art education ought to be put to use somewhere. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? Well, it sounds like we need to perhaps continue the discussions. Continue the discussion. Continue the discussion. We we're not advertising meeting. anything yet. Maybe we're not posting anything on Facebook. This no meeting because we've done, we've done that with a couple of other things, and I'll take a poll of the group here and see who would like to perhaps do yeah. that mm -hmm. later in uh, February, and. Um, Let's all percolate some of this a yeah. little bit. We're not on the deadline. I think a lot of us are excited about. We've got a lot of artistic activities going on in our high school and at our middle and elementary levels. So if we could somehow blend those in yeah. with this as well, um, that would be wonderful so that we can provide venues for our younger um, students who um, want to pursue those careers yeah. um, to understand what's out there for them by you guys bringing in some of the adult versions of what they enjoy doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a plus. And then the healing arts that you were talking about doing, and I'm going to call them healing arts, um, through singing, drawing, painting, and the conversations that it elicits from individuals when they can they can touch t something tactile or use their voice in some way mm -hmm. to be able to express their emotions um, is a benefit not only to the people doing those things, but to those of us who get to see it and hear it and experience it from various uh, forms. Uh, we've also got Dr. Greg Nabi back here who's very tied in with uh, the veterans. Um, and so that's another resource that we can also engage. Yeah, if you could, um, again, um, uh, brainstorm a little bit about what it, what, what it would be called, yeah. what it would be, and, and who we would want to be involved in. Well, how about we do this? Um, we'll, we'll finish our discussion here because we do have quite a few other things that we yeah, yeah. to go through this morning, this evening. <laughs> I'm already on to tomorrow. Um, <laughs> And then and I'm all um, for just having a having a dinner and, and having meetings and we could have a glass of wine and maybe <laughs> we could do it at the Miller House <laughs> and uh, yeah, invite the kids and do yeah. a little you know yeah. bring the kids and I'll do an art sample yeah. okay. and uh, have a brainstorming there. Okay. That yeah. sounds great. Well, we really appreciate both of you. Oh, coming. thank you well, for, thanks your for hosting us. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'll give you my good cards good. before I leave. Perfect. Right. Perspectives from you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have one kind of follow-up point. I, th I think it would be interesting to um, check with the city attorney about just how far that separation of yeah, church and so state too. is. Because I think I don't know why we couldn't, you know, say this is what's going on somewhere. That's not quite the same as having got in the city government. You know what yeah. I mean? So, uh -huh. yeah. and maybe it is a fine line. Maybe it's not. But it would be interesting to hear yeah. specifically. I, I do I do investigate that. And I've, and I've, you know, I've been, I've, I've been on mission trips doing this in, in cultural environments like the Czech Republic and where they've invited me to come and speak at a university, which is a public university. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then they discovered, oh my gosh, he's a Christian. You know? so, so then the criticism that I get thrown at me quite often is, um, well, you're just here to, to, to witness Christ. And I said, no, I'm, just, I'm here as an artist but I also happen to be a Christian. And so, um, so I've had some confrontation in that area, so I'm aware of that. And so this would never be advertised as a way of uh, proselytizing, 
good and smart. Mm -hmm. It it just becomes public knowledge that that just comes with. That's what drives me, and mm -hmm. so um, so people are very interested in learning that because in a way also in, you, you cannot really touch the process of creativity and not come up with the reality of the divinity. So it's, it's almost so like, you know, there's a lot of songs you could sing, but if you go to uh, the Bach Society, you're going to hear. He was a church musician. <laughs> you're going to hear, you can't go to the Messiah and not believe, but, right. but you're still going to hear. Yeah. So, anyway. But, so, I'm out of cards. I, they're not on me, but yeah. I can bring them by sometime. Maybe yeah, right. Sure. Either right. or, or. Yeah, this is just, not just, uh, just uh, future information. Uh, uh, I'll just say that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Uh -huh. We have one other individual that, uh, from the public that would like to speak. Um, I know we had a public speaking earlier. <laughs> yes. so, would anybody be opposed to letting that occur? So that we can look? Okay. And who's that person? Tony, did you want to do speak yeah. part? I saw you grab one of them. Yeah. Thank you. Here. Right Where you want to sit. Uh, I'm Tony Bosworth, TV Realty, and I just wanted to speak on the issue of the Main Street request for proposals for the economic impact study. Um, I like the idea that we're trying to think forward. However, uh, as a community, we probably ought to focus more on having the ability to get Main Street through, which it is physically and legally impossible to do at the moment. Um, and regrettably, I'm going to be a, one of the biggest roadblocks. Um, but it really ought to be focused on how we intend to get Main Street through. And if we really are planning tomorrow or today, what, really, what we're really going to do about the impact of the efforts of the Town Center Update Committee, planning and zoning, and getting through City Council to get projects approved. Um, without, economic plans are great, but we have a city that, to developers, which I am, and I'm also a resident, this city is closed for business. And, um, I'm not saying about me, for me it is, but every developer refuses to even bother to try here. So I hope as part of this economic impact study that some effort can be made. I was looking at the highlights of the items in Julian's note, but some focus needs to be made as an economic impact, how we are going to draw developers or other uses to the community and stand by them. I'm fine that my residential project got turned down last night and I aggravated, yes, but I brought in 2006 a huge commercial development that got turned down and everybody's response to me is, well, we weren't on council then, we would have approved that. That's not true. Every time this council changes in units of eight every year, we end up with the same problem. So I hope as part of this economic development group and as part of a request for proposal that maybe you use that vehicle, i.e. the RFP, and when you do hire somebody, to determine a path in which you can really execute upon an economic study of the impacts of potential growth along any portion of Main Street, whether it's existing or whether it's on the gap between uh, City Hall and Etherton. Uh, so I hope that it gets looked at on a broader scale. Um, I hope that we as a city, I'm a citizen first, I've been here, I've owned property here since 1985 in this city, long before it was a city. And seeing what goes on here continually, <coughs> the anti-growth votes and these 
letterheads on our council meeting minutes that say planning tomorrow today or we encourage development but developers bring projects in for instance my project at uh, uh, my listings at Main Street and 109 which we are going to be in trouble with because we can't get drive-throughs but we need to find a way to make the city there's no use to look at an economic impact study if there's not going to be any economic impact um, brought into this community by developers, tenants, whoever, residents. Uh, and I say, I respect what people say about density and this and that and the other thing, but uh, if we're going to say that we have a master plan that we want to abide by, then let's abide by it. And when we do these studies, let's make it based on those <clears throat> master plans. So, in my comments. Thank you very much, Tully. Okay, the next topic is reviewing the RFPs to look at economic impacts. Thank you, sir. So everybody has a background memo. Um, thank you. That is five. Three, four, five. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it is. So the uh, I emailed a link to everybody with this report uh, middle of last week that had each of the eight proposals included on an online share drive. Uh, this was just so that for comparison, or if you'd like to refer to them during the discussion, you all have a copy of the actual proposal that was submitted. Uh, this discussion started back at the uh, September meeting with a review to discuss the potential for an economic impact of the Main Street extension, um, which we picked up in October, and the committee instructed us to prepare a request for proposals uh, to solicit development, uh, development firms, consulting firms, to uh, pull together an economic impact study of the city's proposed Main Street extension. Uh, in November, we drafted that RFP. Uh, the committee had a chance to review and provide a comment. We sent it out uh, just before Thanksgiving and gave all the respondees uh, just over a month to, to review and respond. Uh, the deadline expired on December 20th. We received eight responses back. Uh, I provided a summary report which outlined the, uh, the basics of the responses. Uh, we did receive those eight um, proposals from a number of firms, actually all over the country. Uh, several of the eight firms do have a connection back to St. Louis. One is St. Louis based. Um, several others have partner firms or uh, outside contractors that are based in St. Louis. Um, much of the approach between all the firms is similar in nature. I think every firm has their own spin, but we did identify within the RFP a list of, of tasks that we really want to make sure were completed as part of the response. Um, so a lot of the approach is, is pretty similar in nature. Uh, the schedule as well. We made sure that this was, it was an RFP, so we were requesting proposals, um, but we wanted to make sure that it was more about the qualifications than it was a, a fee-based approach. Um, because we identified a list of tasks in the RFP that we wanted to make sure the, the firm had the opportunity to respond to, um, we, we do have these proposals inclusive of each of those tasks that were identified. Um, that being said, this is, this is still an opportunity for us to review those firms their qualifications, their partners, um, so that if we maybe like a firm, but maybe not the fee, we can always use that opportunity to work with them to renegotiate an agreement and figure out what the best approach might be. Um, after reviewing the eight responses that were submitted uh, between the city administrator and myself, um, and just looking at their approach, the schedule, and the estimated fee, um, we made the recommendation in the report to proceed with interviews of three firms. Uh, those three were Development Strategies, which is based in St. Louis, uh, the Montrez Group, which is based in Columbus, but their um, partner, uh, Bob Lewis from SLU, is based in St. Louis, and then RKG Associates, who's based in Boston, but is partnering with the Kaskaskia Engineering Firm, which is based in Belleville. Um, we think each of those three firms will do, will do and could do a great job with the project. Um, we wanted to provide the summary of the responses to this committee, as well as the content of each of the proposals, uh, so that the committee can decide how to move forward. Um, I, I, I framed this process based similar off how the RFP for the Village Green was um, organized. Uh, 
soliciting responses, scheduling interviews, um, proceeding at that point with three firms uh, to interview between you know, key city team leaders, um, members of the committee, uh, to decide which of the firms the city is most interested in pursuing uh, the contract with. Uh, as I noted, the, this is mainly a, a response with qualifications. So uh, I think the, the content of the proposal is just as important as the fee. If, if the committee decides that we like one firm, uh, we can always negotiate the contract with that firm to suit the needs of this committee. Uh, but that was the recommendation of the city administrator and I, and I'd like to see what the committee believes. Yeah, as I went through everything, I agree with two to the three easily. Montrose and development strategies are straightforward to me. Um, nice to see organizations that are both based here but also have outside experience would probably bring both in to the mix, which is nice. Uh, RKG and Associates, to me they were kind of middle of the road, but maybe that's just my, my view of their proposal compared to others, but of course, you, know, you read too many proposals, you start mixing things up. And I was, um, but that's, you know, if, if we're talking about three interviews, I'm fine with if you want to throw RKG, RKG back into it. Uh, but the two for me were certainly development strategies and mantras. Okay. Lauren. Um, there's nine it's just next. Okay. Um, when I brought this up, I wasn't sure I've never done any project development impact study, but of cost. It um, seems like a big number for, for this type of project. What's, what's the driver for, for the cost on these? Is it the, you know, the, just the labor that's involved or the... The labor. I'd the say labor. There's, there's probably three components to that. Um, one is the, the market analysis determining what type of development, scale, combination of uses is sustainable and feasible at that location. Um, studying the market, talking to real estate professionals, getting a good grip on what is actually suitable to be, to be, to be developed here. That's, that's a big chunk. Um, another piece is we I wanted to identify the impact on the city's traffic network, um, which to most of the firms triggers a need to engage a traffic engineer for full traffic analysis. Certain firms that emailed or, or called us and asked for the level of detail, I tried to hit hard on the fact that it's conceptual, intended to be <clears throat> estimates, um, just wanted to know what new traffic would be generated by the development at the location and what existing traffic on other arterials might be rerouted to this location. But several of the firms did engage traffic engineers as part of the team, which definitely increased the cost. Um, you know, those those two mainly, um, I think the interviews with development profession, professionals does add extra cost, but um, the proposals that some of the firms submitted with the fee breakdown, you can see which pieces contribute more of the cost, and traffic was big and market analysis were big. Um, if we're not nearly as concerned with the number of jobs or, um, or maybe if we don't need three different development scenarios, which we requested, of different combinations of land uses, that would definitely lessen the overall cost. Um, I think when we initially brought the concept of an economic impact study to the committee in October, um, we didn't have this list of tasks, it was still very early on. Uh, when we started drafting the RFP and adding more tasks, it definitely added more work and more cost. Um, so even though the, the fees were very spread across the board from 27 up to 90, you saw a lot in that 50s and 60s range, so at least the firms were pretty consistent in recognizing the level, level of work and detail that goes into a study like this. So I was almost the opposite on 10 because the first thing I noticed about the Montrose group um, was on page five, they listed poverty rates twice and it's in their um, demographic comparison. So I thought that that had to be a typo. And if it's on the, really the second page of your presentation and you didn't catch it, it told me about the quality of work. And they addressed you by your last name about a mister. And I thought that was really odd. And that came directly from the principal with their letterhead. So I thought if I found 
two typos on the first three pages, it's not a good indicator of the quality of work. However, I recognize RFPs are a lot of work, there's no guarantee of income, there's a deadline, and they're probably working on a lot at once. But I didn't see that in the other RFPs. And, and my, my personal um, admiration for the Montrose Group proposal, uh, <coughs> while it's a reputable firm, it's based in Columbus, my, um, my rationale for, for that firm mainly is, is their key partner, which is Bob Lewis. Okay. Um, so we know the quality. Oh, yeah. Bob, Bob was the principal development strategist for 30 years. He was okay. the founder from 1985. Right. And uh, most of the relevant projects that Montrose have identified were Bob's projects in St. Louis. He is Mr. Market Study, Mr. Economic Impact Study. Okay. And I've known Bob for a long time, and I trust his work on anybody's. So that just wasn't reflected. Right. That's what I thought. Okay. So then the other thing I thought when I looked at all of them online, that's all right. When you read so many, it does kind of run together. <laughs> I actually thought I liked um, RKGs the best, and I think what stood out was the examples and the pictures of the diversity of work that they did, and when I read the bios of all of their uh, staff, um, the level of experience and the backgrounds that they had, I thought was quite impressive as compared to some of the other ones. I liked development strategies, that was my number two. My one thought was because they've done so much work in St. Louis, and when I looked at the pictures, I'm worried we're gonna get exactly what we've already seen in Brentwood and everywhere else, and were they the ones that did the care? No. That was another group. Okay, so that, that was my only thing, is I would want it to look different, whereas I thought some of the other firms that had connections to St. Louis but we're based out of state may have a more diverse design group because we I don't want to look like another neighboring city. But you know, I think if we tell them that that's what we don't want, then that's what we'll do. Um, and then just two questions. What um, why did A and E not make the top three or A and E? I don't know, I wrote the initials down in my notes, that's not helpful at all. Is it Angelo, Angelo, Angelo yes. economics. Oh, Angelo? Yeah. yeah. Um, primarily, the <laughs> proposal was good, but they were by far the, the highest. Fee. Was that because you were in the last one? Yeah, their fee was significantly more than, than the last, and even if we renegotiated them, they're significantly more expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's fine. The, one, the other thing <coughs> I liked about um, development strategies, which Tim liked, um, I like that they covered specifically in their language on supply and demand that it was contextual. So it was, they were really gonna look at whatever outside area competition was. And presumably the other studies were, they just enumerated it better. And, uh, so I'd be fine if you wanted to bring in those three. Anybody else? I just said, just one thought. If we did some work on uh, traffic studies before, could that be information provided to them and therefore reduce the cost? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would expect it to be. It was, it's only three years old. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Those yeah. studies identify future growth and traffic for the main arterials, one on one on Manchester. It did not identify future traffic for Main Street. Mm -hmm. um, so that's largely what this group would be asked to do. Um, but also identify from the future growth traffic of those arterials how much of that traffic would be rerouted to the new Main Street. Mm -hmm. How much traffic would use Main instead of 100 as a you know, cut through? Yeah. My, my question is for this study, what will the output of this study be used for? What will it inform or what decision are you trying to make with this study? I, I think this helps us, you know, anytime we talk about, um, there's, there's various tax incentives that, you know, you can do and we don't want to get into a lot of that. I don't want to do TIF funding. I know we've mentioned things like that before. There's other economic development packages and funding sources and incentives. I think this helps us make a decision about whether or not any of those things are reasonable or worth it um, from a benefit analysis. I think the other thing is, is if the discussion that we had at council was that um, there are benefits to rezoning this three acres to support commercial <coughs> development. Ideally, we would know from the study if more immediate residential high density was needed within so much feet or half mile or whatever so from that, that building. Yeah. 
of Main Street. So would the output of this then need to be aligned with the work of the Town Center Update Team or the, the Department of Planning? Because if that indicates that something has to change, then this should be aligned with the work that they're doing. Otherwise, they're going to put forth their recommendation. And I don't know if the timeline's aligned, but you may come after they've already provided those recommendations. So I'm just wondering if that alignment is there. Mm -hmm. um, so part of the task was identifying new developments could be anticipated largely in the 20 acre um, area surrounded by Main Street 100, Etherton, and Market. Uh, and when we identified in the RFP, uh, the allocation of <coughs> use that can be expected between retail, entertainment, office, hospitality, mixed use, residential, similar, as, recommend, as recommended by the city's town center regulating plan. Um, so a part of their scope was within the confines of the land uses recommended in the town center plan how can we allocate different land uses? What generates the most return? What generates the most impact financially? Um, so part of the scope will be definitely working in concert with the town center regulating plan as that changes over the, the next six, eight months. Um, I think part of our purpose was to do this analysis so that we would have that along with the recommendations from the town center team so that we could look at recommendations from the town center team, what kind of economic impact is that going to have potentially on our, our ability to develop a tax base that will support the community long term. When we were starting this, we were in a much, a much different position as far as revenue is concerned. And we may be, again, a year from now, who knows what um, the state representatives and senators might do. So our goal was to look at how we had it mapped previously, or currently, and then determine what kinds of um, developments could go in those particular areas to maintain revenue stream for the city of Wildwood. And that will then be used to base zoning decisions based off of what this study tells you? Or are you going to use the criteria of what zoning allows? And the well, they would have to. We would have to use the criteria for what zoning allows as it stands today. Yeah, because I think. And then look at what what the town center group is proposing as part of this process to determine whether or not those proposed changes in the town center plan. I mean, I'm I'm going to admit straight up that I was looking at the town center update committee plan and I was a little concerned that we were cutting back on more of our downtown district um, even in that plan uh, because that reduces the amount of space we have for um, business development and I'm, I'm not trying to push people out of building homes and uh, having spaces within town center, but I think there needs to be some balance on it. So we're trying to use this particular task to get some outside perspective from uh, some expert individuals so that we can have a full picture, I think, when it, when it gets back to council, in addition to the recommendations <coughs> from the, the team that's used a lot of time, a lot of effort, and talked with residents. So we're not going to kick that down the street at all. Yeah, I think it would just, it probably would be helpful to make sure there's alignment between the town center update team and then what this study says. Otherwise, we're asking the town center update team to do all this work. They're having the public come and talk, and you're not, you, they're not using this as an input into that decision making. You're actually waiting to make the decision later on. So therefore, then you're over, potentially overriding what they have recommended. So I would think it would be helpful if you can, I see an opportunity to connect the dots between the town center update team and oh, the economic yeah. development. Oh yeah, I totally concur with that, that we would have to have a discussion with that team as part of this effort, I think. And I think at its core, most of the firms really hit on it, part of the proposal. This is 
it's a cost benefit study. Does the benefit, does the economic impact and the financial benefit of extending the road outweigh the cost of building the road? And if so, by how much? So just one last follow up to that. I mean, I think we've been committed to extending the road. I don't think there's any doubt that we don't want to extend the road. So I'm just wondering, you know, is there some reason why we would doubt ourselves that we need a study to tell us that we want to extend the road? That's all. Um, and I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Joe, because that was one of my questions, is not just the overall, how are you gonna use this, but like, specifically, how would you use this if, say, a developer came to our economic development manager and said, hey, I'm looking at doing ABC project in, in Wildwood. Um, like, how useful would this actually be for you? I think it'll be useful having the direct feedback from the developers of what is sustainable in that location and what the, what the attached financial gain is to each. The, the combination of land uses, how it's distributed throughout the site, how does that, A, is it feasible, B, how does that result in revenue back to the city? Um, that's important. Um, also knowing how it impacts jobs, what types of more, what types of development create additional jobs, what is the best use of the city's traffic network. Um, using that to maybe target certain types of development um, or certain types of developers that fit within the realm of <coughs> what the consultant identifies in line with the recommendations of TPAP. So, I mean, would this be, could a developer look at this once it's done to help them make a decision whether or not they're gonna invest in the so, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. um, That's a good point. And most of the developers, and developers, most of the firms also identified separately outside of the scope of this project to be available as contracted RFP writers, negotiating incentive agreements or redevelopment agreements of, of any kind with developers down the road. Most of these firms work hand in hand with developers on a regular basis. So most of these firms recognize that is the, the purpose and the intent of the document is to use it to attract the development. So while it's not essentially an RFP for development, it, it helps us get to there. Right. And then um, as far as tying it in with say like what KeyCut is doing mm -hmm. or what the you know the Village Green design firm is doing, I I was really looking at this as more of a uh, just like an all-encompassing effort, you know, of, of we we have already decided that we want to, to extend Main Street, and that's a mm -hmm. you know a goal of the city. Um, so I just looked at this as as its own separate entity, basically. You know, Town Center Update Team is going to give recommendations of what residents want to see. Um, this is going to give you know a very good idea of what businesses could see. Um, and the Village Green, the, the, yeah, and the Village yeah, Green design is going to give, process. you know, kind of a, uh, you know, put it into picture, I guess, you know, or put it into focus and, and give you a better picture of it. So um, I don't necessarily see where they need to be perfectly aligned. I see it more as, um, you know, good information coming from, from multiple sources. So. Yeah. Joe, what's your perspective on this, I'm going to ask? Certainly I've been participating in certainly I've been participating in the economic development committee meetings as an observer and mm -hmm. I've given the opportunity to speak and mm -hmm. when the matter came up, I offered no objection. Mm -hmm. I think there's a benefit to it. Um, the firms that Sam and Julia looked at, two of which I would have selected as well given the opportunity, and I didn't okay. need the opportunity, quite frankly, mm -hmm. they know what they're doing better than I. Mm -hmm. So, I too, like Mr. Garitano, just want to make sure that we understand that we're looking at economic impact from development, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have three acres of it. Mm -hmm. Because that's the least economic benefit to mm -hmm. that property. Mm -hmm. And so, what I think that what we need to look at is what uses will go there and those uses will they generate the income necessary to build the street mm -hmm. because at the end of the day i think we're better off if we have development build the street in the city sure yeah so maybe this is the city attorney question or a joe question or so you know reading the rfps in my understanding when we put it out 
um, as a request was that these firms are going to come back and tell us that based on the area no she was okay oh, oh, okay um, that you know they're going to say X number percent can be retail X percent makes sense to be dining mm -hmm. X is fine dining okay um, per, retail compared to specialty boutiques that can be supported and then X number of increased <coughs> residents as well so mm -hmm. if, if let's say uh, we get a restaurant proposal that comes in or planning and zoning does and we have to have legal reasons to um, turn something down, right? It has to meet specifications so we don't get sued for discriminating against one particular business. Can I use this study to say, although you meet the design requirements and standards of the city of Wildwood, you are now the fifth business of the same type on this street, and our economic development study shows that we cannot support this uh, business sustainably in our community. Is that a good reason? I mean, from, from a public policy school standpoint, we would have said yes. But I'm saying from a city ordinance standpoint, is that? I think they will study the market and see what's sustainable here, how much there's still remaining of supply and demand. Does well, our supply think, out there? When you look at bankruptcies, and you know, sometimes it's easier to fold and take a tax write off, and you look at other economic trends, as, Sometimes the private sector doesn't always make good decisions for their long-term interests. So my fear would be what happens when a corporation like that wants to move in. What power do I have to make an educated decision when they meet our standards that are already on the books and duplicate it? And we've been talking, you know, at, um, it, it's not Ellisville, Manchester has just now limited because of ordinance the, the number of massage shops, right? They actually put it in the books because they had so many applications. <coughs> Is that something that we'd have to do in the future, or does, or can I use this economic development study as enough reason to say we do not need our eighth taco shop and our tacos on the same block, right? Can I? Well, I think we're kind of getting deeper in the weeds than we need to right well, now. Well, this helps me because this is also a justification for funding this. Okay. If I can use this information, it makes it an even more powerful study. That's why I'm bringing this up. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. That's all Kevin. Um, I just want to keep things moving. I'm not. Yeah. I, I'm sorry we have to cut off. So um, I'm a little shorter. No, I think connecting Main Street is obviously a, a pretty high importance to all of us. Would it be permissible for me to ask Mr. Bosworth a question based upon what he said? I don't see any reason not. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to because I, I think I heard you right at the beginning of what you said. I think you said something like. Um, that the Main Street connection you might be an obstacle to or something like that. I wondered what you, if you could explain what you meant by that. Um, I know s staff is aware, and I think that some of the council members last night now are aware to ask the question. However, Crestview is a private one. Mm -hmm. It is owned by effectively nine people, which I'm one. It is joint and several. I don't own 442 feet of my length by half the street. It's, everybody owns an equal right. So it requires the unanimous consent of the property owners that are part of that deed for Crestview Drive, plant, whatever number it is. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, to get Main Street through, now you've landlocked yourselves to the point where you need 40 feet of my, my 442 feet on the south side of Crestview Drive, mm -hmm. and my project has been politicized and bastardized for 24 months now, 28 months now, and I'm going to hold a grudge. And I am not going to sell the property, condemn it, but if economic concerns of the cost of Lee Main Street through are generally are really a question for the city they need to start making better decisions as a group to get shot down when we had 70 plus people in a meeting of which 100 percent for my project now i don't speak something about my project and maybe that's not what you asked but you physically are unable 
So you might as well not spend a dollar. You are physically unable to put Main Street through without condemnation. Unless we have 100% approval of the nine lot holders, of which you're one. Plus the three, you're one. Plus the three remaining property owners plus the three, on the right. south side of Crescent Drive. Right. If you look at the alignment on Matt, probably everybody probably knows, but if you go out the front door and look straight up, it's offset 40 feet off the 20 feet of the current Crestview Drive. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, for the purposes of time, I'll go ahead and make a motion that uh, you go ahead and proceed with interviews for Montrose Group. Uh, 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 oh, sorry. I should have that up in front of me. For Montrose, Montrose. Development Strategies. Development Strategies and RKG. And RKG. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll second. second. Oh, Cheryl, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Sorry. Okay. He has a question. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, just, just discussion on the motion. Um, I guess. Uh, lost my train of thought there for a second, but um, I, I would just say we should lean into the interviews to and, and have a direct goal of trying to see what we can do to lower the cost because I do think that yeah, I don't these are high. Um, so as long as we're going into it with with the understanding that. We're going to try to come out of it a little less expensive mm -hmm. than, than what we have going in here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm fine with, with supporting the motion to, to start the interviews. But. And I think we've heard from some of the residents and some other council members that there are specific topics and directions that they want taken on this process. So um, we'll need to include that in some of our questioning um, as we move forward. Because I, don't, I know not all of you were here when we saw the economic development study that was done by a local firm here in town um, previously, but I, I, I was appalled. It was, it looked to me to be a cookie cutter um, that they just threw out there. It had nothing to do with the city of Wildwood, so I am very, very adamant about making sure that whoever we bring on board um, looks at developers, businesses, our processes that we go through uh, to see how we can streamline and make it easier for um, the residents and for the development community to be able to coexist. And then where, where in the budget would this be coming from? That's, we have $5,000 identified in our consultant line item, so obviously anything north of that will we'll have to go to council for a recommendation to use. Yeah. Probably out of fund balance. This is a You've heard me say it before, this is a one-time cost, so I mm -hmm. think fund balance would be an appropriate source for that. Okay. But okay. certainly, that's my intent is to negotiate our way down to a reasonable rate that still gives the information that the company needs to make decisions. Okay. Then I'll, I'll say aye to go forward with the... Uh... Okay. So from this this point, mm -hmm. I would recommend that we get back with those individuals, um, representatives at each of the companies. You indicated that you wanted some representative from this committee Correct. participating in that. Do you have a decision, the two of you, uh, on who that would be? I, I, I'd say we probably want to emulate the process we use for consulting selection for the parks for the Village Green, you know, we, we can certainly conduct the interviews of a couple of council members when we attend, but mm -hmm. our intention would be to record those. Um, since it's still part of the negotiation and we haven't brought anything to council, I think it's closed. Mm -hmm. It's appropriate for a closed meeting to have that interview. Mm -hmm. We'll make those interviews available online for folks who cannot, you know, attend the meeting okay. and let them review that. Does anybody want to participate? I know we have a few. Depending on timing, yeah. Mm -hmm. You won't be here then. Yeah, depending on time, you know, yeah. Okay. How about Niles, Lauren, and me? Okay. I, the invitation is open for everybody. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. yeah. Joe's not here anymore, but if, if Joe wanted to, yeah. it's Ward 8, so if Joe wanted to be in there, I think yeah. that's Joe appropriate to too. So. Yeah. too. Okay. I'd kind of like to have Joe in there so that we can bridge some of that gap. 
Okay, and we have several other items, but we do have one. How many people are going into the next meeting next door? Well, your chair's got to go to the meeting <laughs> next door. Yeah. So, um, we had said we'd stop at 7. Live stream has to switch over to it. Yeah, live stream has to switch Is there anything else that we have that we can't postpone? I don't think the so only one that's time sensitive is the equestrian, um, just because we do want to get some consensus from this committee to move forward with the two events that we've discussed in the memo. Yeah. Um, one of the events is an April event that we've been discussing for a tax swap. Mm -hmm. um, and this was discussed at the last meeting, but uh, given the, the timing, now that we're a few months out, we want to make sure to get this committee's uh, A-OK -okay and moving forward with those so that we can proceed. I did check with, um, if you don't mind me jumping in, um, Missy to see about dates like she might be available and because she has experience doing this before and I think it would be great to involve in it and she suggested the last Saturday of April. Okay. Okay. Um, I can do a motion to proceed with the tech and the tech swap and the fun ride and for Cheryl to continue working with the chair and Julian and or Parks and Rec or whatever, insert names. Um, and that's all you need the motion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, the one thing is just that for the fun ride, if you could do a draw for people that aren't riders to come and see, just advertise to them too. Yeah. For, Say that again, please. For, for, the, for the fun ride too. Oh, so the, the fun ride. Yeah, okay, I was getting to go the tax oh, one. No, 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 sure. no. I, I yeah. have a big pun. Thumb tax, right? <laughs> <laughs> I write a paper. No, yeah. I have, have a saddle for you. No, for a saddle. I have a few. Your loved ones. That was the first. Pardon? That was the first. So no, I don't know if the date fits in with the calendar here. I think it does. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Yeah, that would be the twenty fifth. It would be the day after the B grade five K. Okay. So okay. Do we have to go to planning and parks to get that locked down? Uh, I think economic development committee is fine and. With Sam's permission, I'll just send the SID board to notice that we'll be using the top deck of the garage. Perfect. Okay. Groovy. And then Cheryl, if you can continue working a little bit with Julian to and Missy to get things moving forward, and then I'll report at the next meeting about the fall. Once I get a hold of I may call you too mm -hmm. again just to see what uh, Dr. His name escapes me. Robson. Robinson. Robinson. Okay. No, Robson. Robinson. No, no, Robson. There you go. Do okay. in terms, just real quick, um, and if you have something else you got to cover, I can do it another time. But what are the opportunities between now and then to disseminate information in general within Wildhood? Uh, is there sort of the, you know, website or social media, but is, is there another event between now and then? Between well, now and the tax swap? Yes. We have the cabin fever hike at the end of February. Mm -hmm. We'll have the spring egg hunt at the beginning of April, mm -hmm. and then we'll have the Feed the Brave 5K uh, the day before. Mm -hmm. So there's three events we can do it at. We also um, will use the newsletter as well, which yeah. gets to about 2,000 households now. And we we'll use the lawn and garden event too, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, I think it, it would be good to kind of leverage some of that oh, yeah. to make sure that the word gets out because there's not there's not the expectation that there might be like with the you know the X Y Z hike that's done every year where people are like oh yeah and that should be coming up about now I mean there's mm -hmm. none of that so it, it's got to you need to get the word out yeah, I mean they're private channels to do it but. We certainly should use what the city has available. And Missy had said when she was here at the last meeting that when people in that community hear TAC, everybody shows up. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a specific audience, so I think yes. you know, it'll be helpful to promote these at those events. And I'm thinking the fall event, mm -hmm. you know, will be a better event for us to advertise during the other things that we have. Mm -hmm. And just, we do have a few minutes left. Um, 
without needing to postpone the, the t-shirts topic, one important part of that was included in the memo is obviously this year is our 25th anniversary. Mm -hmm. We considered using the shirts as an opportunity to custom design a logo for the city's 25th anniversary. I put in the memo that we have an opportunity to, in a way, crowdsource the design of it. Um, using an online website, Crowdspring, you can put the request out there for $299 and have 60 to 100 designers send you concepts. Um, other businesses in town have used it to design their logo for their company, um, and we thought that we could use the t-shirts as a way to crowdsource the design of that logo for the city's anniversary and then use that logo to create t-shirts and bags and hats and mugs and everything else. Um, so not just limiting it to one type of apparel. Um, the only reason I bring it up is because I know talking to several people in the Department of Planning and Parks, we're already into the 25th year now and mm -hmm. we need to start moving on the logo preparation yeah. sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And so when we were discussing this conceptually last week, they said this logo design is pretty time sensitive. Um, the crowdsourcing of the logo is relatively inexpensive depending on which tier you choose to pursue. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the committee in, in some way is aware of that opportunity and at least in some right is okay with us pursuing that option. It looked to be the like the least expensive option, yeah. really, uh -huh. and more of a variety. More so I mean, why would you not want to do that? Uh -huh. yeah. In my opinion, and then I say bring it to the next council meeting and say, here's four, here's two choices. Yeah, and I thought we could even put the t the finalists out to the residents to vote on on the website or social media. Yeah, might as well continue to do the crowdsourcing all the way through. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. that'd be fine. Good idea. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I can't speak to it. Second. Second. Cheryl, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those abstain. And the February meeting will also be at 5 30. So the night we'll double stack with BNP. Mm -hmm. um, so look for that February 25th at 5 30. Mm -hmm. We're done. We're done. Free. You, you wanted to vote some more, didn't you? you made it. Yeah. Yeah.